Dear Heavenly Father, Father God, we praise your holy name and we thank you for helping us to be able to hear your still small voice in these days that we are in right now. Oh, Lord God, we praise your name and thank you for helping us to be able to hear. And for those who cannot hear or are struggling to understand how, it's that still small voice. And you might say, what does that mean? Well, hearing the voice of the Lord is a sensitivity. Now, some people really struggle with this, and that's okay. And I'm sharing with this tonight, the Lord has placed upon my heart. Now, first, a disclaimer. Praise God. And Father, we just thank you for this. We pray that you will anoint this program. We pray that it will touch people. We know that we're running out of time. We do not know how long this program will be on the air. We hope it will be for a while, but we don't know. We, we don't know. We, what we do know is everything is utterly uncertain. And that's actually very exciting. And I praise you for that, and I praise you for the revelation. I praise you for the peace, and I pray that I can impart that peace upon the hearts and minds of the people that will participate in tonight's prayer vigil, but also be excited about an opportunity to maybe perhaps embrace some ideas that per maybe, just maybe, um, haven't been imparted to them in a way that they were comfortable receiving it. Um, Father, as you know, there are many different teachers, many different members of the body of Christ. We praise you for anointing each of us and touching us in your own special way. And we pray in the name of Jesus as our time is running short. Now, we don't know. We could be here for years. We understand that. And Father, we just praise you, Father, because you, only you, only you know. You know, Father, not us. And we just we know that you're rising up around the bride. We know that you are separating the sheep from the sheep, Ezekiel 7, uh, 34, 17. We know that uh, we... And the Jews have been made into one because you have broken down the middle, middle wall of separation, making two into one. Ephesians 2, verses 9, 10, 11. Uh, in that range, read, praise God, and we thank you, Father God, uh, for helping us to understand and become excited about the days that we are in and realize that, well, we don't have much time to pussyfoot around, and we have to get down to business. And uh, and that means that, uh, praise God, you know, Father, if if we continue on, and, and for a while, and for maybe even for years, I don't know, we'll see what happens. But, Father, in accordance to your will, uh, thy will be done. And uh, we just praise you, Father God, for also revealing to us that not only that we not only do we want your will to be done, uh, but we do have the uh, expectation by the throne room to contend with you. Uh, so it's a combination. You want us to contend, as, as in 1 Kings 22, 19. You want us to have that conversation with you. You want us to reverently approach you with ideas and thoughts and positions and things that we petition and, and desire and, and let it, letting our, our requests be not made known to you that the peace of God that passes all understanding will be placed upon our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus because we know that you have our petition. Father, and we just, we, we if as long as we are kingdom centric, that we are perpetually and always looking for an opportunity to further the mission of the kingdom, understanding, Father God, that you as our Supreme Court Justice, the Most High El Elyon, are going to make the final decision one way or the other, and sometimes the answer is no. We don't always understand those things, but you do, because you see the beginning from the end, and you understand the end result. You and you alone understand whether or not a particular individual may or may not receive. You and you alone understand that whether or not you will be glorified in that event. And, Father, that takes a humbling, a crushing, really, of our own personal pride, but also an empowerment in the understanding of our Scripture as, as we progress in our walk, hopefully with a humble and contrite spirit, so that we're able to receive more, so that we do not adopt the belief system of any one individual, but we understand that there are many ways to pray, and that we understand the meaning behind Romans 8.26, that likewise the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Father, there are so many people that we could, we could learn from. We could follow this person, leave out the name, that person, leave out the name, this other person, leave out the name. And if we compared all of the things that they do, we would discover very rapidly that they, are not, they do not all have exactly the same beliefs. They do not all have exactly the same ways that they pray. They all have differences, things that work for them, and, and, and maybe things that didn't work as well. And some of them experimented and tried different things, and some things work better than others. And that's exactly how it needs to be, Father. And we praise you for that, and we want to, we want to thank you 
for that impartation, that, that revelation, that outpouring of your presence and an understanding of your wisdom. Father God, we don't want our wisdom. We want your wisdom. And I pray in the name of Jesus, Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, Father, that you may indeed be glorified by all of our works that we have ahead of us in the days to come. And assuming that maybe, just maybe, things might get a little bit bumpy sooner, sooner than we think. We don't know. We don't know. Maybe they will get smoother and calmer. Maybe we are just in the beginning of some of the bigger birth pangs, and there could be a period of time uh, between them that we're not anticipating right now. But at the same time, we just don't know, Father. And as it says in your scripture, I don't know, but you know. And we love you, Father. We thank you for protecting us. We thank you for being the he who shadows us in the protection of your wings, that secret place of the Most High, that place of peace where we can come while the sky and the earth and the and the, all of that around us that circles us and then encircles and encapsulates our dwelling places and our prayer closets are full of bustle, noise, confusion, and people just running to and fro. We thank you, Father, for that time. Now we understand that we need to be disciples, which which comes from the root word of discipline, which means that we have to pretty much force ourselves to do things that we don't want to do. And there are going to be times that our health is ailing. There are going to be times when our bodies hurt. There are going to be times when we stay up too late. There are going to be times when we have insomnia. There are going to be times when it's too difficult to get on an exercise machine, if that's what, what we feel led to try, or go for a walk because it's too cold. But Father, we just pray that you will continue to work with us. You will lead us to that place that you will enable us, that we will be able to touch other people's lives in the days that come ahead of us. Father God, we know that these days are the days that we have been chosen for. Whether we are to lead the charge, Father God, right now through prayer and allow the next, you know, maybe the uh, slightly younger group of people to take the helm as we get older like Abraham did, Abraham at the time did, um, you know, and so many other of the patriarchs. At some point, they had to turn over the torch. And Father God, we don't know how long we're going to be here. We just don't know. We know that we want your will to be done. We know that only you have the ability to see from the beginning from the end. But we also know, as Moses did when he stood on the, that mountaintop, I, I feel in my heart that it, you know, that it was a mountain. It may not have been. I don't know. But I feel that he, he spoke to you and he said, and, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, Father, you know, please don't destroy the Israelites. Because you will make your, make yourself look bad, uh, you know, for releasing them into my care, you know, releasing them in accordance and setting them free, you know, and and because our father, as we all know in the scripture, was was very upset with them and wanted to ultimately destroy them, and he was upset. And um, Moses talked talked him out of it, and he relented. That's the key word. If you use your amplified or your King James, I'm sorry, New King James. You will see uh, the difference between the usages of the word relent, praise you, Jesus, thank you, Father, and the differences between the word repent. So that's one of the humongous advantages of using the New King James over the King James. Um, praise God. Uh, and also, of course, it comes up in the Amplified and probably many other translations as well. But uh, if you want to stay as close to the, the Textus Receptus, which has the most amount of Scripture and arguably the most contextually um, as well as spiritually accurate renditions of the text, not discouraging supplemental understandings from other translations at all, uh, praise God, uh, then, um, uh, you know, my, my personal favorite is, you know, if you were going to buy a paper Bible, thank you, Jesus, to buy a New King James and an Amplified paper Bible, if that's what you feel led to use. Um, also, if you're using, and I know that the, the power is going to go off eventually, praise you, Jesus, thank you, Father, we need to prepare ourselves for these things. We don't want to be caught off guard, we want to, you know, if we can, and we can afford it, to buy lots of candles and things like that. If we live in a cold place, you know, maybe think about cutting some firewood and putting some extra firewood. You know, sometimes uh, there, there, are, there are options available to us that we just don't even think about because we just don't think it's going to happen to us. And Father, we, we, we know that, that, that your scripture says in Ecclesiastes 7.14 that the days of prosperity, you know, we should be joyful, but we should also know that the days of difficulty and darkness they both come from you, ultimately, because when you lift your hands of protection off of this earth, or off of a place, or off of uh, any anything, an, an individual, indeed, even an individual, that really, really bad things can ultimately happen to them. 
And Father, you know, and that can be a form of chastening. There can be chastening that comes directly from from you through a form of chastening. There can be uh, refining that comes uh, by a choice that was made by you, and that refining can come either through you directly, or it can be, you know, in, in a situation whereby you step aside as you did with Job, and uh, and uh, and allowed that to become an example for all of mankind of someone who stood his ground, stood by you, and also to help us to understand how the kingdom dynamics work, and that you are ultimately in, re- in utter, not, not just ultimately, but completely and utterly in charge of all the things that are happening across the earth, it absolutely, beyond any shadow of a doubt, clears up any confusion to anybody who can spiritually discern it and understand these things. And when we do come to this understanding, it becomes a revelation and something that we can build on as we grow. And we thank you, Father, for revealing these things, these things to the hearts of babes. I thank you, Father God, for the beatings and the times that you have had, that have had, indeed have had, to take me personally behind the shed, because I wanted something that I shouldn't have had, and you showed me why I shouldn't have had it. Um, perhaps a little stronger than I anticipated, uh, but nevertheless, um, it certainly woke me up uh, and uh, has been a difficult journey, to say the least. I praise you for it. I thank you for where it has brought me to in my work. I thank you, Father, for the determination that you have placed upon my heart. I thank you, Father, for teaching me that I cannot stop fighting. I thank you, Father, for for showing me that even when I was slipping and falling and having the doggone this difficult time, that my determination to not be taken out, my determination, my standing up in my own bedroom and walking around and saying, I will not be taken out in the name of Jesus. Father, the times that we had those conversations, the times that I came before you, Father God, the times that I fell to my knees and cried because I, I, I wasn't strong enough. I, I didn't have the, the discipline. I didn't have the, uh, the uh, um, self-control. I allowed depression to creep in. I allowed self-pity to creep in. I allowed so many different things to creep into my life. And um, I allowed them. I allowed them. And that allowed the darkness to get a stronghold over me, and it became a a roller coaster like journey. And um, Father, but I wouldn't give up. You knew I wouldn't give up. I kept telling you personally. I kept raising my hands up into the sky and looking at you and telling you, I am not going to quit. Thank you, Jesus. And I praise you for the journey that you have brought me through. I'm not suggesting, Father, that I would maybe not slip again. I don't know. I'd probably slip again tomorrow for all I know. I have no idea. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And though he may fall, he will not be utterly cast down, for the Lord will uphold him with his hand. Thank you, Father, for upholding me with my hand. Thank you, Father, for upholding everyone listening to this program with your hand. Thank you, Father, for placing upon my heart a desire. Not just that I, I knew it was from you. I wasn't thinking about it. I was just opening up things as I always do to prepare to do a regular old program as we all, all normally do. And just like you did, you, and just as you led me on the last prayer vigil, I felt in my heart as strong. It was so um, not in synergy with my thoughts. And when I knew that that thought came to me, this is one of the ways that you know that the Lord is speaking to you. Okay? Coincidences are clearly beyond any shadow of a doubt. Now, now watch yourself. Watch yourself. One of the keys to understanding some of the things we're going to talk about, and I thank you, Father, and I'm going to be praying to our Father even as I, sh- I share with you things. Praise God. Because we are running out of time. Now, I don't know. You know, maybe I die tomorrow. Right. You know, we we plan God, you know, man plans, God smiles. Right. Amen. All right. Now, all that being said, I don't know. And quite frankly, I really don't care. But at the end of the day, I just what I do care about is Jesus. I care about his love. I care about his incredible forgiveness. I care about the testimonies that have been brought uh, uh, to this program over the last 10 years. I care about all of the teachings and the trainings that you gave me, Father, the things that you led me to, not the things that I um was led to because somebody said, oh, Johnny, you got to listen to this or that. But things that through your Father, your divine providence, the supernatural coincidences that I learned early on to start to hear. And um, I want to be able to impart my journey, a little bit of my journey to the listeners of this program. So maybe you can consider, I'm not saying that it's the journey for you. I'm not. I wouldn't do that. Not everybody's journey is going to be the same. Praise God. Not everybody's journey is going to be the same. We're not all cut from the the same cookie cutter, 
Okay? We're not. And so some preachers, some ways of pe people's teachings are so much more, maybe they resonate with you better. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. My feelings aren't hurt in the slightest. I just know that as I was setting up the program tonight, out of the clear blue sky, I felt talk about divine healing and casting out demons tonight. And then I was like, okay, Lord, because when you are walking in that place that I can't explain it, it's some kind of a supernatural harmony that you on your own ought to find comfort with. It should be your personal personal journey and never be offended by someone disagreeing. Never learn from it. Um, David Thoreau said, I believe it was him. I hope it was him. It might not have been. It could have been Twain. I don't remember, but it was a famous witticism. He said something along the lines, I think it was Thoreau. He said, every man, and remember, remember to the pure, all things are pure. So whatever you do, don't stereotype. Learn to get past the source of the information. That's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to go out and look on Wikipedia and search all over the internet for all the dirt that you can find on anybody. That's what the devil wants you to do because guaranteed if you look for the devil, you're going to find the devil. See in Titus 1 verse 15 it says, to the pure all things are pure. So again, to underscore um, and unfortunately, I rebooted um, my um, computer. Uh, well, I didn't reboot it. I added some patches, and I didn't realize that um, it was going to interfere with my access to my PC study Bible. But that's okay. I'll just do the best I can from memory and let the Holy Spirit lead me. Praise God. I believe it's in the book of Romans. It talks about... Uh, those who minister and pastor and uh, those who are give, let them give liberally. Um, and you can search up, you know, you can search on the Internet for uh, the words minister, give liberally, um, uh, and you'll find it. I think it's in Romans, but I'm not absolutely sure. I can't memorize the whole Bible, and I am flying. Uh, you know, I have some things that I put into the, the, the uh, show notes, and I have some things that I'm going to share with you. But um, the first thing I wanted to share with you is if you can go, and I'm going to share this with you right now, praise God, because this is about enablement, okay, because we're coming upon a time. Listen, I just got a notification that, that, uh, that Biden, who we know is not, He's not human. He's not. Okay, the Lord has shown that clearly to me. Okay, he's shown it to some other people who are not even believers. He's not human. Okay? Whether he's cloned, whether he's perfectly possessed, whether he's, you know, a shape-shifting reptilian, which I personally believe that that's what he is by now, certainly. Probably cloned and a reptilian entity has taken over his body, which would make sense because, you know, even as he continues to become more of a drooling Alzheimer's, uh, whatever you call it, entity, um, that is a, actually kind of a blessing for those of us who are awake and aware to the Nakash in Gen Genesis 3. So if you study the Nakash, N-A-C-A-S-H, the Nakash, they're known as the Shining Ones. They are also two legged serpent creatures. They're spoken of in the Testament of Amaran, and they're spoken of in the Testament of Reuben. They're also spoken of in many, many other ancient writings as well. And they lord over us. These are fallen seraphim. So when you go and you look up the seraphim angelic beings, and all you have to do is type into your Bible if you have an electronic version. I really like for the Android, I really like um, the olive tree version, and it takes some practice to get used to it. It's hard to do with your fingers, especially if you have a super small screen. But if you have a, a pretty decent size screen, like a plus version or whatever, um, with some care, you can learn how to work it really well. And the neat thing about the olive tree version, praise Jesus, thank you, Father, for this, praise you, Lord, thank you for showing me, is it has some of the best um, study material. There's like, for 10 bucks, you can get a New King James plus Strong's for it. And, um, you know, and they charge you for every Bible that you buy. And they give you a lot of free ones, too. But one of the things that's neat to learn is that if there's a scripture, and I can give you lots of them. So if you write me at jbaptist777, while we can still talk, um, uh, I will send you a copy of the show notes. And it has uh, so many scriptures in it that I cannot even 
articulate it. I don't know how many there are, but I love them all. Um, I love a lot more than is in it too, but that's beside the point. Praise God. Um, and a lot of the stuff in the sections of the prayer vigil that we've been doing now for, what, almost two years? I don't know. Um, are They're broken out into sections, and there's also injected a lot of really good prophecies in there as well. So if you want a copy, don't be shy. Email me at jbaptist777 at gmail.com. Um, and Voila. Hallelujah. I'll send you a copy. I think I have it uh, converted it over or whatever and put a copy of it in Microsoft Word or whatnot. And you'll have all of that. You'll have a ton of stuff in there. It's actually pretty, pretty darn big. I might even have to send you a link to my uh, to my Google Drive. So if you get a link, just click the link and um, Hopefully it just works for you, and if it doesn't, let me know, and we'll figure out a way. All right, praise God. Uh, maybe I'll set, you know, because sometimes I make accidents when I share links uh, with my Google Drive, and I don't want to do that. So let me know if it doesn't work. It should download right to your computer. It can even download exactly, I, I, you know, depending. And now, if you have an older version and you're retired and you're using an older phone, well. I'm sorry, uh, but sometimes it won't work very well because, you know, the older, earlier versions of Androids that they sell to people that are retired are very underpowered. And so you may not be able to open it. As a matter of fact, for the longest time, I couldn't open it on my exceedingly powerful Android, which is a Galaxy S10, uh, simply because it was just, well, too big. All right, praise God. So, But now they fixed it, and uh, I am able to access it. Praise Jesus. Uh, now, if you have a computer or a laptop, you'll be able to access it very nicely. Uh, and study from it if you want. All right, praise God, and you will be blessed. All right, now, all that being said, um, the Lord, hearing the Lord's voice, so I have to start out with this. If you don't understand the fundamentals of the walk, now, I don't have enough time and I don't have the luxury to teach you everything that I've learned in the Lord and that the Lord has shown me and the supernatural coincidences and the supernatural testimony that goes along behind all of it. I have that luxury. I can't. I wish I could. Now, you know, and, and, and I, you know, I praise God that I am not in a situation right now and the Lord has blessed me with a job where I don't have to, like, you know, put it, make them into DVDs and sell them for thirty nine ninety five. And a lot of people will say, man, why is it, you know, free, you have been given freely, freely you give, freely you should, you know, freely you've been given, freely you should give and all that. And I understand that, but folks, you know, if you're going to have a set of DVDs made up, it costs money, you know, and so if you spend your own money and you're operating 100% for the Lord to do that, you simply just can't. You can't. You can't do it. I've had people, I've hooked people up with uh, uh, pastors and, and preachers that specialize all they do, 24 by 7, 365. They even have emergency response services on pagers to come to your house in emergencies. Uh, you know, the, some of these guys take this stuff very seriously, but they have no other form of income. So, I mean, for us to judge them, that's just wrong. It's just wrong, you know, and a lot of people will do that because we are programmed by the flesh because it's a sin, but we're programmed to judge other people and to think negative things. So the things that I'm going to share with you tonight, that is exactly what's going to happen. Satan's number one thing is to take any blessing that you have and to rip it out of your hands. So the very first thing that you're going to hear in your heart is as I share these things with you, you're going to get what's called a check in your spirit. It's not a check in your spirit. I promise you, from the bottom of my heart, before Jesus, may God strike me dead with some horrible, painful, agonizing death from the bowels of hell. If I am even in the tiniest little bit cheering, I have no motivation. Qui bono? Why would I bother to spend my own Friday night after one of the, a very, very difficult time at work very, very long, hard day. I've been up since 4 o'clock in the morning. The time now is 8.27 p.m. You can do the math. That's 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I think we're working on about the 17th hour, roughly, give or take. Um, you know, why would I do that? What would be the point? Can you think of one? Okay. Well, since you can't think of one, then it must be because I'm serving the Lord. Okay, so right now, using the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, for greater is he that is in you than he that is in the, in, in, in the world. And please understand, I am not sitting here and working from a script. Okay, so as I am sharing these things with you, I am simply sharing what the Holy Spirit places on my heart. 
and the scriptures that I'm reciting, I might not get exactly right because I'm doing them all from some of them, which I might read from the prayer vigil notes, will be helpful to, helpful to me, and I can give you chapter and verse. Sometimes when I say a verse like, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, I don't know what the chapter and verse is. But I have written the Lord's word upon my heart, Psalm 9111. Sorry. I th- yeah, it is Psalm 9111. I remember that one because it's like 911. <laughs> 911. But um but anyway, um I always try to think of clever ways to help me remember. The other thing I do is when I have memorized a verse, um by saying it over and over again and placing it on 3 by 5 cards, I like to write them down and laminate. You can get that cheap lamination which is just you pull it out, it's like sticky and you can put it on the cards and you can carry it a couple of your favorite verses around with you and then just pause. Pause. Take a break. Take a break from work. Everybody gets a little bit of a break and just repeat it over and over and over again. And then challenge yourself to try to repeat it without even um, looking at it. I mean, think about it. People, you know, when we were children, we made A, B, C, D, E, F. We didn't get the alphabet right away, did we? We had to be taught the song, didn't we? Yeah. So anyway, you know, just sharing these things with you because they're all part of my journey and maybe it'll bless you. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. All right. So, so one of the things that might help you because it was something that helped me well over 10 years ago in my journey, and it is a journey, is I got... Now, listen, please, I am going to say this just one more time and you will either, either receive it and be blessed and grow in Christ and the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the power of Christ in your life, or the devil will grab a hold of you and you will start to search on the names of the people that I am talking to you about or my experience. If you do the latter, you will fail because that is the devil placing into your heart. This, what I am going to share with you tonight, this is absolutely beyond any shadow of a doubt. The worst case scenario for Satan. Okay? Do not think that your computer will not break while you are listening to this, that you won't get a blue screen of death, that your phone will not stop operating, that you might not have to come back and download it later and try again. Don't think that you're not this is going to be uh, easy. Don't think that the journey is easy. Okay? Um I, I the Lord speaks to me in so many ways, I cannot even begin to share all of them. I, there's too many of them. But you have to transcend and sense the spiritual. If you are a heavily scientifically minded individual and you need to see proof for everything, you're going to be in trouble. Um, I have always been a, an HSP type of a person, highly sensitive and, and very familiar with human nature, human emotions, and all that. And I've even had a well-known preacher argue with me on, in person, on the phone, telling me, oh, no, you've got to control your emotions. And I'm like, you're totally not reading the Bible I am. And since then, this individual has been, well, pretty much wrong for the last five years. But anyway, that's okay. Um, people try. And we need to pray for our brothers and sisters that the Lord will help them to see. Because the tendency to get stuck in a rut, the tendency to come to a place in your walk where you believe that you have arrived, that's the devil. Curry Blake, who I happen to like very much, but doesn't get everything right. Um, now, at first, I thought he got everything right. And I believed everything that he said. And boy, I got so fired up. I actually, I I was so fired up. I spent uh, a pretty good chunk of change, but that's okay. It wasn't that much, like 30 bucks or something. I was basically the cost of the DVDs. He was doing a wonderful thing, putting them out. And it was uh, it was basically of his version of John D. G. Lake's Divine Healing Tech. And you can go out and search on John G. Lake's, and by golly, you'll find all kinds of evil talk about John G. Lake. Things like he had a drinking problem and all this other stuff. Well, you know, there are preachers out there right now that preach that if you even sit, there's no such thing as a sipping saint. I'm like, okay, well, then you just called Jesus a sinner. So you better go repent, buddy, and you better get the presumptuous sin out of your life because you obviously are a Pharisee. And I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. Read your Bible. 
Jesus did not sin by making water into wine. End of story, end of argument. Rebuke it in the name of Jesus. The Bible tells the truth. Now, are we commanded not to get drunk? Yes, we are. Are we commanded to obey the laws of the land? We're commanded to surpass the laws of the land, which means you don't drink and drive. Now, uh, anyway, and you need to understand, so these are things that, these are fundamental understandings. This is 100% Bible-based Plus, what I'm sharing with you is also stuff that is testimonial and experientially based on my walk uh, that has been very difficult and wrought with tribulation and learning and chastening and all the things that come along with the journey. Um, but I, if I took you on a 10-year journey, it would take me probably a set of 20 DVDs. And if I wrote a book big enough, it would probably be just as big as uh, Dr. Joy Jeffries Pugh's trilogy on um, Eden to Armageddon, uh, you know, and and that whole thing, you know. So, um, you know, I've, I think I have something like 520 articles on tribulation-now.org, tribulationnow.com, tribulation-now.com. And it's all completely redone and works beautifully with mobile. And I'm putting new stuff up multiple times a week. All right. So anyway, so first, learning to hear the Lord's voice. You have to, this is what the Lord told me. This is why I will, we are all on our own journey, okay? And we're not all cut from the same cookie cutter. This is why there is the, the whole dissertation about the body of Christ to be found in the Bible. And quite frankly, the T, the NLT, New Living Translation, it does the best job in 1 Corinthians chapter, I would recommend reading 12 and 13, but I believe 13 focuses the most on the body of Christ. Again, I'm doing this all from memory, so do, you know, don't be afraid to hunt around uh, a little bit, but the NLT does the most, it's so supremely awesome, it's just words cannot describe. It is bar none anointed. Praise God. But it doesn't, but you, after you read it, you also want to go back and read it in the New King James because there are going to be some nuances there that you, you'll, you'll start with the New King James and then go over to the NLT and have the wow factor. Then go back over to the New King James and read it again because there's little secrets that are whispered in there in the New King James that are not in the NLT. That's why I'm not, it took me, a decade. It took me pretty much, well, I started to, the Lord started to show me how the multiple translations were anointed in different ways and different books and things to learn better and different versions of Bible dictionaries, use of lexicons, Englishman concordances, various uh, anointed uh, commentaries for very hard to understand things that are oftentimes incorrect, by the way, so you have to be able to discern past it. And it takes time. And it can be frustrating. And because I knew the gravity of what I was doing with the program, I had a moment. I wasn't angry, but I was very sad and scared. And I went outside, and I looked up into the sky, and I told the Lord, I can't do this. I cannot teach. I cannot lead people. It's, it, the stakes are too high. And I'm discovering, Lord, that everything that I learned is wrong, and it's really troubling me. Which means that if I teach people what I know now, it's going to be wrong. And I cannot explain to you how powerfully, praise God, thank you Jesus, how powerfully I felt the Lord saying to me. Now, I, it wasn't an audible voice, but it was like, essentially, unlearn it, let it go. Just let it go, get, get rid of it, trash it. Crash it. Get rid of it. I'll show you. Which, by the way, aligns to uh, James 1, verse 5. If anyone seeks wisdom, let them ask God who gives to all liberally. Who gives to all. Who gives to all. Who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And it shall be given them. The very next verse is scary to me. It basically says, and you know, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's, you know, I don't even want to memorize this part of it. Okay? I know enough about it to know that I don't really want to care. I don't care about it. 
but I will paraphrase for you. It basically says, let them ask, believe, you know, in faith, believing, because if you don't ask in faith, believing, you're a double minded man and don't th- let let. You know, don't be tricked into thinking that that man will receive anything from the Lord. See, now that scares me. I don't want to know that. I only need to know the first part. I don't need to be told that if I goof up, I'm going to be double-minded. But I know my scripture. That's the difference. I've lived it and I've walked it. So for somebody who needs to learn it fundamentally, it is a very important thing to understand. But you can't. here's the thing. The devil will use the second half of that scripture to discourage you. You don't have enough faith. You don't have enough faith. That's exactly what's going to happen. So it's fundamentally good. So when you're establishing your foundation of spiritual understanding of the scripture and our walk, there are many, many admonishments in there that we need to be aware of. But but at the same time, as we progress in our walk, we are aware of them. But to foster and promote our faith, we are aware of them, but we don't want to let the devil throw them in our face. What did the devil do? This the Holy Spirit just places on my heart. I know it's from him. I wasn't thinking of it. What did the devil do to Jesus when they were in the, when the whole testing thing in the, in, the, in, the, in the desert? Exactly that. He used the scripture to try to trick Jesus. Jesus used the scripture to throw a pie in his face. And he was very weak and run down after 40 days of fasting. Oh, my goodness. That was water fast. Don't be trying some of that wacky stuff that people over in Europe tend to do from their Roman Catholic upbringings and trying to like do like no water fast for like long periods of time. That is just unhealthy and not smart. All right, praise God. Um, uh, thank you, Jesus. And, the, and many people believe that the Daniel fast, he said, he, I ate no good meat. It's kind of like, to me, it's kind of like a nuts and fruit um, sort of a super duper uh, South Beach diet kind of thing. (laughs) Praise God. All right. Hallelujah. But anyway, so um, we need to. We need to um, we need to come to that place where we're progressing forward. We need to be able to come to a place where we understand Titus 1, verse 15. And I'm going to see if I can use this. I'll try it. Let's see if it comes up. Oh, goody. So Titus 1, 15. I want to read the whole thing to you because this is very interesting. This is a mystery of the Bible. Praise Jesus. It says, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But their mind and conscience are defiled. Their mind and conscience are defiled. Now, don't read too much into this, okay? Because the devil will place it upon your heart to suggest that anybody out there whose ministry or their calling is to rat out the devil, because there are people that are given that, that duty, by the Lord, through supernatural circumstances, etc., etc., etc. So don't let the devil trick you into using this against a fellow brother or sister who is at that place in their walk or that has become their calling. Okay, because I can give you plenty of examples where Ezekiel uh, and others were shown some pretty horrible things by the Lord. And very tactfully through the scripture, they described what it was they saw. Like, you know, Ezekiel, digging the hole, you know, in the side of the temple and seeing every abominable creeping thing. No doubt there were some creeping nakash shapeshifters inside that temple as well that he saw. Fallen seraphim. Isaiah, search on holy, just search on the word seraphim if you have your King James or your new King James. Although some of these things, like flying fiery serpents, only shows up in Isaiah in the in the actual King James. Yeah. So have your multiple translations with you. Or use the internet while we still have it. For the good of God. We should be doing everything for the good of God. Praise your name, Father. We just praise your name. We thank you, Jesus. Father, just allow people to receive. Father, teach them to rebuke. 
if we resist the devil, he must flee. When the thoughts come into their head, Father God, just teach them, Father, to say, leave now. Leave now. By the way, as I go on, praise Jesus. I just wanted to let you know that um, when you talk to the mountain, when Jesus was explaining how we use the power of Christ, he said that we talk to the mountain. Okay? You don't pray for a demon to leave. Okay? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. No. It's not how it was designed. What we're talking about here, so, as you progress in your walk, once you've flushed out all the things that you've been taught, because there, I guarantee you that there are weaknesses. I do not care who you studied under. I do not care what books you have read. I do not care how very famous they were. I do not care how many millions of people they delivered from demons. To me, it's irrelevant. Because we're all different. And we all have to find our way. But each man you know, seek his own salvation with fear and trembling. We are all part of the body of Christ. Now, I will share with you what the Lord has placed upon my heart. And it has brought me to a different place than everyone else I have studied under. It doesn't mean it's, it's a bad place. And if you choose to study under somebody else and you like their style, then at least put it into action. If you're not putting it into action, you have wasted God's time. You have wasted your time. You have wasted the kingdom's time. You will get no credit for it whatsoever. So at least attempt to put it into action in your prayer life. Just so you know, the Lord didn't have me do the prayer vigil so we could all pray together over things. That's part of it. But the biggest reason was to enable the saints. Okay? And so that's very important. All the dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of prayer vigil shows that you can go back to listen to, if you so desire, have different... You will note that if you go back to the first one, over time, they changed a little bit. Over time, they changed a little bit. As the Lord teaches me new things, by the way, this is how we should all be. We should all be like this. And that's where most Christians fail. As a matter of fact, it was Curry Blake who taught me when I took his divine healing technician training. And the technician term was used. It was a phrase that was coined by uh, John G. Lake because he actually set up what he called divine healing rooms. And he taught people. He called it a DHT. And, and I, th- you know, I, I, I don't know the whole story, and it's irrelevant to me. I don't have enough time. And even when I was taking the training, I, you know, you still have limited time. We all have to eat and sleep and do things and stuff. But I did, one of the things that I did like about taking it, it was kind of cool, was that Brother Curry Blake, or if you prefer, Pastor Curry Blake or whatever, um, who's, you know, the, uh, he, he doesn't, I don't think he refers to himself as either. I think he calls himself the, um, I don't know, he has some biblical term for what, what he is over, John, over the ministry. But anyway, I felt, I was impressed with, his testimony. I was impressed with how he did things. I liked how he teached. And so I, but I didn't stick with him. Okay. I don't expect you to stick with me and believe everything I say. Okay. Okay. We all have to go on our own journey. Okay. Praise God. Now, what I will share with you, and I pray that this helps a little, is that my journey is very unique in the sense that I've studied under Many, 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 many teachers that were absolutely the very best. So imagine this analogy. Imagine if you wanted to become, now I know the martial arts is, you know, full of all kinds of creepy, satanic, weird symbolism and all that, but I'm going to use it. By the way, Curry Blake likes the martial arts because he just doesn't really think about the devil part. He just liked the discipline and everything. So, you know, you got to learn to see God in everything. Because the devil really does hijack everything. Now, I'm not saying that the devil doesn't inject his devilness into everything. He does. He twists it. 
He alters it. And I'm not saying that learning the martial arts is a godly thing to do. No way, Jose. No, 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 no. That is not what I'm saying. I'm just letting you know. It's not something that Curry, he just liked doing it. Maybe just because it was a good workout or something. Who knows? I don't know. He didn't talk about that. All right. Or maybe he liked the discipline. The exercise. Whatever. Praise God. Now, um, but anyway, event, there, hopefully there will come a time in your walk when you learn. But this is not something that you learn from Scripture. Because people will go to the Scripture and they will say, well, Paul judged, you know, Paul says you got to judge, 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 judge. And so the devil, of course, is going to tell you to judge. In fact, the devil's going to tell you to rat people out publicly. That's what the devil will tell you. Remember Peter when he stood before Jesus? Jesus looked at Peter. Peter was one of his favorites. <laughs> one of his favorites because of his emotional, his emotion-driven, impetuous nature was something that Jesus embraced and loved. And why is that? Because that impetuous, emotional nature is the God spirit that you were gifted with. The analytical, scientific, critical nature is the pharisaical nature of the flesh. Sen sen women are more sensitive. No one will debate this. This is well known in, 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 uh, in any study. Anybody out there who knows this, women are just inherently more spiritual and more sensitive than men. And men who have or display sensitive characteristics are called names by society. We all know this. That's because the earth is the dominion of the prince of the air, ultimately, unless our Heavenly Father is protecting it until he that restrains is taken out of the way. Second Thessalonians 2, probably around about verses 3 or 4. Okay? And he that restrains is not what churchianity tells you. He that restrains is a big thing. It is us praying, the Holy Spirit. It is Isaiah forty three twenty five becoming a reality. Us praying before the courts together, uh, before the courts. It is where two or three are gathered. There I am in your midst. It's the. It's so much. It's the whole. It's the saints praying down. God's will. Praying down and also petitioning him for things that maybe he didn't think about. Oh my goodness, that God didn't think about? Well, if you know your Bible enough, you would know. You'd know the story of Moses. You know what he said to the Lord and that he relented, changed his mind, and didn't destroy the Israelites. Praise God. All right. And there's so many other examples. If you do a word study, on the word relent. All right, praise God. So as you grow in your walk and you learn to flush the proverbial heavenly cesspool of bad information out there that you will get from virtually everybody that you study under, you'll get good stuff. See, so if, so if you wanted to become... Here, let me not use the, the uh, martial arts example. That's a great example, but... I'll use another example. Let me see, because I'm trying to... I want to steer clear from any opportunity for the devil to inject fiery darts into your head, especially if you're not really good at calling down the holy fire and protecting yourself with the thorny hedge of protection every morning, or you're not, or just simply not doing it, or you have, you know, some sin in your life that might be hindering your walk and growth. And then you never are sin-free. Anybody who thinks they're sin-free is, forget it. That's why it's a continuous process all day long residing in the secret place of the Most High, self-examination, knowing your word, knowing what sin is, knowing all that stuff, abiding in that presence, abiding in that presence with humility, love, power, joy, just totally surrendered, where you can feel, you feel the Scripture. You feel it. And when you get to that place, that the wonderful, wonderful place where you can just... Thank you, Jesus. Like, I can just sit in front of this microphone and I can chatter for probably, I, can, I bet you I could go for 12 hours. And one scripture after another scripture after another scripture after another scripture after another scripture would just pop into my head. 
Praise God. But it took a lot of reading. It took a lot of prayer vigils. It took a lot of three by five laminated cards. <laughs> a lot of discipline. A lot of beatings. A lot of difficult times. All that kind of stuff. The Lord didn't even show me about presumptuous and until I had to go through some of my beatings. And then I knew the mistakes that I had made. Bad ones. Not good. I would have definitely been passed up for even any opportunity to be part of the Bride of Jesus if I had carried with me some of the feelings that I had in my heart, which were a form of iniquity. Iniquity is a perversion or an inaccurate belief system that is baked into you that becomes foundational for your behavioral system. That's what iniquity is. So iniquity is thinking that you, by virtue of living in America, have a God-given right to carry a gun and shoot people to death in a godly way. That's called iniquity. Iniquity leads to sin, which is when you pick up the gun and start shooting people that are probably Christians working for law enforcement. And as you're murdering those Christians to save your family from the evil people that are dressed in black outside of your house, don't think that Jesus is going to show up with, you know, and welcome you into heaven. And there's so many people that don't. They they can't they until you get to a place where you can discern spiritually the scripture and you rise above it and you feel it. You can do all kinds of great types and shadows teachings and stuff, but you're going to be lacking in a lot of areas. A lot of areas. That's why iron sharpens iron and we should all be willing to listen but not necessarily adopt what somebody else says. And I know we always hear the thing, seek the Lord, you know, seek the Lord, see if it is true, pray. And I, I've had so many people tell me that I just wanted to pluck my spleen out with a shrimp fork. It was annoying to me. I don't like that. If you don't know how to seek the Lord, that does you no good at all. What kind of a minister of, of, of the Word of God leaves a potential opportunity to grow somebody up in Christ hanging by a, a cop-out phrase like, well, pray about it. Go pray about it. I'm like, forget that. That's not what I'm about. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I want to help people become, well, thank you, Lord. And the only way I can do that is to share my walk, my experience, my testimony, which is very diverse. And I didn't just study under Curry Blake. I didn't just study and I studied under many people. I've, you know, I've had so many people point me and say, "Oh, you got to go listen to all the YouTube videos of brother so and so. He was the founding father of casting out demons and you know what? Person was definitely awesome. Did a wonderful job, wonderful work for the Lord. And I cannot suggest in even a nanosecond that there is one single thing I would disagree about at all. However, what I would suggest is if a person really, really wanted to maximize their effectiveness, what they would do is they would study under... If you wanted to become the best mathematician in the world, you would want to study under... You would want to go to this college and get your P get a PhD from this particular professor, and then you would want to go over to this college, this other college, get admitted to that one and study under that particular professor and learn their tricks and stuff and the things that they learned in tactics. And then you'd want to go over to another college and get another PhD from another professor. And then, in order for you to rise and shine above those three that you learned from, you would want to take the best things that you learn from each of those professors. Professor number one that I went to uh, at Penn State taught me that if I think of it like this, I'm going to come up with the answer in my head really fast, and I'm going to be able to you know, solve this calculus equation. What a cool idea. That's great. I'm going to adopt that. But you know, the other professor that I studied at, uh, you know, did mathematics under Oral Roberts University or whatever, he taught me that I could do this and this and this. And then I take both of them and I put them together and I learn something new. And then I make it better and better and better and better and better and better, better. And we grow. 
and we grow and we grow and we grow and we grow. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. And we grow. But you don't have to take my journey with me. But maybe it will, I don't know, encourage you to take your journey. Or you can take my journey if you want. Or maybe you have been taking my journey. It's one form of a journey. Anyway, um, I'm going to play for you something that's fascinating. After I play this for you, and it's, i, I got to watch my time. Thank you, Jesus. But I want to share this. This is so important. I'm going to share this testimony. This is a testimony from Curry Blake. Now, I took his divine healing teaching. He also has what he calls um, SWAT. He, he's clever with acronyms and, I, you know, good marketing and all that. And um, he calls it uh, Spiritual Warfare Apostolic Training, SWAT. Kind of clever. And he backs stuff with tons and tons of scriptures, but he's not infallible. Nobody is, including me especially. But I have studied under, oh my, um, David Hogan, Curry Blake, um, what is her name? Oh, well, of course, Charles and Francis, Francis Hunter. Uh, the author, oh, the, the list of books that I've read are so many. I would say that I've probably, um, oh, what's the guy's name? Bob Larson, who has a few things that I'm uncomfortable with, but that's okay. Um, but does some things incredibly well as well. Um, but the list is kind of gigantic. Every one that I studied under, I took something from it. In fact, when I was um, dealing with my own personal problem with the SRIDID event in my life, which wasn't me, it was somebody else. I'm not going to get into the details. Um, and I talked to Danny Duvall about it, and, and I had a lot of counseling, and I was coached, and I, I, the whole deal. Uh, so I, I kind of knew what I was getting into, and I, I felt that, you know, for all the wrong reasons, and I didn't know that, but the Lord had to let me go through that journey for more, more than, I mean, for probably about 20 reasons. But it was a great learning experience, even though it was a fantastic, it was a horrible time of my life. Let's just leave it at that. But I learned a lot. And the old saying, being, getting beaten all the way down so the Lord can build you back up again. Oh, boy, is that true. Hallelujah. Um, and there's nothing, nothing that will give you faith better than being cornered. <laughs> than having, like, everything taken away from you and having no place, no, no, no plan B. All, all your, because man, man plans and God smiles. Jesus tried to tell us, don't worry about a thing. Don't worry about what you're going to eat and sleep and all that kind of stuff, you know? But we can't help it. Now, because we always have a little bit of the flesh gnawing at us. We're trapped in it. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So anyway, I'm going to play this for you. And then we're going to talk a little bit about it. Now, I could go in and do an advanced study and line up a whole bunch of scriptures to back everything. But if I do that, this would be probably... Two hours a night, five days, minimum. So I'm going to keep it short and sweet. You can either do your own homework, or I do highly recommend that you get, at, at a very minimum, buy the book, whether you get it on Kindle or paper, who cares. Pigs in a Parlor, that's a good start, starting place for spiritual warfare. I do mean starting place. Um. Also, uh, there's an excellent booklet for free by Canaan Ministries, that's spelled with a K, Canaan Ministries out of South Africa, on um, SRADID prayers. So if you were to type in, let me see if it comes up anymore, because uh, our search engines, now I'm using DuckDuckGo now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to type in K-A-N-A-A-N Ministries. Um, S-R-A-D-I-D prayers. See if it comes up. Oh, my goodness. Duck, duck, go. Very top. D-I-D slash S-R-A prayer book one. 
Canaan, K-A-N-A-A-N Ministries. Now, you have to understand, when I started my journey, I started out with Andrew Walmack. Now, don't be looking up stuff because anybody who has an impact on anybody's life has entire websites and YouTube channels dedicated to disparagement. We had one believer that we were bringing on the program who seemed pretty anointed, but he was. I found out that he was publicly disparaging other preachers publicly, and I said, brother, you can't do that. And he said, well, I have to. I have a duty to do that. And I'm like, okay. So I admonished him, and I set him free. And he'll have to face maybe the devil in his shock if Jesus says, be gone from me, you doer of lawlessness. I have not known you. So many people puffed up. So many Pharisees. But again, please understand, and this comes after many beatings. Believe me, many, many beatings. People who understand, this is all spiritual. Everything I'm sharing with you is very spiritually discerned. There is not a single theologian in the world that will share what I'm sharing tonight. Not one. Because they can't. They can't. People who understand will never judge. And people who judge will never understand. But what about Paul? And what and what about him, you know? Here's the thing. You can't look at the Paul you can't look at Paul's letters. See, when Paul was writing the letters to the church of Corinth, he was writing them to the leadership of the church. He wouldn't it wasn't like you know, and the, and what the leadership of the, the leadership of the gathering chose to do, um, you know, because you can discern this if you understand it. Now, how do you learn to understand it? You have to read Titus, you have to read First Timothy, and you have to read Second Timothy. You also have to read First Corinthians chapter fifteen, but um, heavily lean on Titus and First Timothy and Second Timothy because that is the guidance. All the New Testament is guidance on how to behave as a Christian. It's our roadmap. It's our roadmap, including the stuff that Jesus taught to the Jews. So, churchianity will try to tell you through their evil method of, their deceived method, I won't call it evil necessarily, because it isn't to all people. Some people, it's just, they don't know any better. That's how they were taught, and so that's how they teach. I have I've literally knew a very good kind-hearted saint who is doing a great job following the voice of the Lord. Then he decided he wanted to become a pastor. He was so excited about getting his, quote, degree, which of course is not sanctioned by Jesus at all. That's okay if you do want to do that. I'm not, but I'm saying just watch out. Be careful because they're going to teach you stuff in the curriculum that is false. It's incorrect. Sorry. Jesus ordains the church. Jesus ordains his teacher. Jesus ordains his prophet. De- Jesus is the head of the church. When you study to sell, show yourself approved, it doesn't mean pay somebody a bunch of money to give you some bogus THD degree so you can walk around and call yourself doctor this or doctor that. Doctor, 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 doctor. That's not what it's about. It's about humility. It's about sharing. It's about not seeing yourself more or less important to the body of Christ than another. Not flashing diplomas, implying that you are somehow smarter than everybody else. SRA DID prayer book, it's really good stuff. But you have to understand, until I was taken on that journey, I didn't search for it. Until I knew that I was being attacked by witch covens, and I knew it. Um, I didn't search for it. So then my journey continued, and I had to change. I changed up tactics. I learned new things. So if you listen to how I pray in the beginning of the prayer vigils, you will notice that over time I changed things a little bit more, a little bit more, because the Lord kept showing me more things, more things, more things. And he would take me on a journey. I would slip and fall. Then I'd get my honey cheeks kicked into another dimension. My whole life would be turned upside down. Uh, I'd be 
licking my wounds, to say the least, uh, going through all kinds of stuff, and then I would realize that I am oppressed, that I am under heavy attack. This is serious. I have got to break the stronghold. I have got to break it I've, because I don't have anybody to go to. I can't go walking into a church. I can't go walking in and, and have the elders lay hands on me. It just isn't going to work. I had to fight myself out of the hole myself. And that takes some doing when you don't have any other... Bo- now, I did ask for people to pray for me, and I know that their prayers were heard, and I praise God, and I do pray all the time for anybody who prays for me. I do. I ask the Lord for a, a multifold, many times, uh, magnitude of blessing upon them. I do. Uh, not every single day, but I do a lot. Because I believe with all of my heart that that's what pulled me through the difficult times that I, because because it was like a roller coaster ride. I was like, I'd get up now, I could get up and I get punched out again. And I was like, okay, this is getting ridiculous. That's when I put out a petition to the listeners of the program to pray. Now, I wanted to set the foundation for you to understand that my journey is diverse. I didn't learn from one teacher. I didn't learn from one book. I didn't learn from one university. I did not learn from somebody else. It was a journey I took all by myself. It was me, our Heavenly Father, the Lord Jesus, an untold number of supernatural, unbelievable experiences, to say the least, at very experiential I've even had ordained pastors tell me at one time when we were praying together because I was having a problem and I was casting lots with a thesaurus, she said to me, and she was wonderful, she was wonderful, and she prayed with me, and uh, she even said to me, oh my gosh, you hear from the Lord way better than me. And I'm like, I was just casting lots. To me, it was second nature. And I got two perfect, ca- you know, two perfect openings of the thesaurus. That's a whole other teaching. Today, I carry with myself... You can buy them on Amazon. I carry a golden yes-no coin, and I anoint it with the Exodus oil, and I pray over it, and I consecrate it to the Father. Proverbs 16.33 says, uh, The lot is cast into the lap, and its every word is from the Lord. James 1.5 says, To anyone who seeks wisdom, let them ask God, who gives to all liberally and without all liberally without reproach, and it shall be, it shall be given them. The apostles uh, needed to replace uh, Judas, so they cast a lot, and it landed on Matthias. Was it a coin? How did they do it? Irrelevant. Because you can search until you're pink in the face, and you're never going to figure it out, because I tried. And don't get me going on omens and thumens and all that kind of weirdness. I mean, that's 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 the stuff that we'll learn about when we get into heaven. I I you know, and I do. I'm a big believer in all of that. I know we're going to have to learn about it when we get into heaven. But that stuff is so advanced. That's like you know, order of Melchizedek stuff, and that's way. We got bigger problems ahead of us, folks. I just got news today. Just so you know, praise Jesus, that Joe Biden is setting up 300 FEMA sponsored locations against the wills of the governor all across uh, the United States of America to accelerate the vaccination upon people. Why do you think he's doing that? I'll give you two words, Johnson and Johnson. Solve a bioweapon with a bioweapon. Seeding evil, eugenic Satanism. Pray against it. Rebuke it. We're going to talk about that now. All right, we're going to talk about that And by the way, divine healing and casting out of demons are very closely related. Okay? Just going to share that with you. The book of Mark, by the way, is your best biblical point of reference. Although, I strongly recommend the book of Mark combined with the book of Acts. Okay? Mark and Acts. You will learn lots. And by the way, pay attention to the details. I recommend re- learning these both these books with the New King James. If you can have the Amplified parallel beside you and you're going to use paper, fine. That'll help. All right. I'm going to play this for you. Um, and again, 
Okay, so I'm going to play this for you because the Lord has led me to share this with you because I want to talk a little bit about it. All right, so I'm going to turn up the volume so that you can hear it real good. And this is called, this is a testimony from Curry Blake when he was much younger. <laughs> I, I chuckled because I was much younger then too. I've learned a lot since then. And, um, I, you know, the Lord uses me to minister to people who have the gift of divine healing. Because they get discouraged and stuff. And I'm like, well, have you thought about this, brother? And they're like, oh, my God, Lord, send me to you. Thank you, Jesus. But, you know, it's part of the walk. It's just my walk. And I'm sharing you with as much of it that I can, as best as I can. So this is called Curry Blake, if you wanted to search it up yourself, on YouTube. It's called Curry Blake, C-U-R-R-Y, space, B-L-A-K-E, the Sudafed anointing. Now, he spells it kind of, I think, a little bit different. Some some companies probably spell it this way, but he spells it S-U-D-A-F-E-D, with an, you know, S-U-D-A-F-E-D, space, anointing, the Sudafed anointing. Now, what's fascinating is he actually kind of, in his divine healing training, I don't know if it was a mistake or something, I don't know, but there was a disconnect between his, how he, what it, something he said and what he should have learned from his own testimony, the Sudafed anointing. But I'm going to share this with you. This is very important, because this, this particular part of his testimony, he was so determined to... Become like David Hogan, who who um, inspired him, and he mimicked him. By the way, I, as I said in the last show, if you want to learn to speak in tongues, go back to the last show. Mimic my speaking in tongues. That's why I was doing it so much. Get set, close the door, pray, raise your hand, do what, mimic it, and your chances of receiving it are ten thousand times greater. You probably already have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues doesn't always come down unless people. Help, help, help you out a little bit. And most people have no idea what they're doing today. All right, praise God. So anyway, um, this is Curry Blake, the Sudafed anointing. And we're going to talk about this right after this is over. This is 10 minutes long, so hang in there, okay? And if I can cut, it, you know, I, I just, I'm going to let it run until I feel, if I feel a nudge to stop, I'll stop. And then we'll talk, all right? Praise God. I, I want you to, to grasp some of these concepts. Praise Jesus. All right, listen to this him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And I think that would have woke me up too. Okay? And she, she began to afflict him and his strength went from him. And she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he woke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before. Now watch it. Here's the secret. He said, he woke up and he said, I'm going to go out like I have before. And he says, and shake myself. Now see, in the New Testament, this is called Stirring up the gift that's in you. That's what he was doing. He was stirring up God in him, upon him, right? Now watch. <clears throat> He's, he, I'll go out and shake myself. Now watch this. And he knew not that the Lord was departed from him. That's what I want to get to. He didn't know that the Spirit had lifted from him. Right? Now remember, under, under the old covenant, the Spirit could come and go because the Spirit wasn't within, didn't abide, it came upon him. Okay, that's the way it worked. It would come upon, and it said it moved him at times. So at times the spirit would come upon him, and he'd be strong. But notice, he could, he could dictate when that happened, because he said, I'm going to do it like every other time. I'm going to go out and shake myself, and then go kill some Philistines. So apparently it was a process that he relied on, that he knew he could do it and cause it to happen. All right, now I want to stop, and I want to help you understand a deviation, for, a slight adjustment to what, Pastor or Curry Blake is saying here. The problem is that Curry believes that it's the faith of the divine, of the person casting out the devils that matters. It's the faith of the individual that is laying hands on the other person that matters. And it does. It does matter. What he misses is that it's, see, remember how I say on all the time the Lord showed me it's not one, it's not A or B, it's always going to be C, all of the above. Okay? 
So our proclivity as humans is to believe that the Old Testament it was one way. Now, there's huge differences between the Old and the New Testament. So to that point, he's absolutely correct. But what, what he's missing and I can show. I could. I could have. You know, done if I didn't have a really long day and I'm not on my 18th hour and trying to keep. You know, but I. I can't. I have to do. What I got to do. So anyway, but I can show you in the Book of Acts where there's proof, absolute beyond any shadow of a doubt, proof that the faith of both the individual and the person praying are critical. It's not one or the other. It's both. Okay, so I'm going to keep on going a little bit, but I don't know. Right. I'll have to watch. He said I wouldn't do it again. And, but the thing is, he didn't know that the Spirit of the Lord was departed from him. Yeah, I wonder if, how long it's going to take to He's get to... He's a man of faith. Hold on a second. About, about three see. or four classes, one each week. And when I finally won Thursday night... And Here we go. The third one, I was teaching on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You know, but my voice kept going out, kept going out, kept going out. And so finally... This preacher friend of mine came up and said, uh, Brother Craig, I don't know if you know it or not, but you know, if you take this, this Sudafed, I don't know if you know what Sudafed is or not. So if you take Sudafed, it, it makes it where you can keep preaching and your voice won't go out. Well, I really don't take medicine and I never have really, just never have. I had no idea what Sudafed did, but it was a pretty strong medicine. So, you know, I take this Sudafed and I drink the water and I'm ready to go. All right, let's go. Tonight we're talking about the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Listen you close. need the power of the Holy Ghost. And about 30, 45 minutes into it, all of a sudden I'm like, glory to God, he's here. <laughs> oh, I, I'm like, I can't feel my fingers. <laughs> well, he's here. I told you, you know, this was during the Pensacola revival, right? So I'm like, everybody get up. And, we had, and I said, turn, turn the lights down a little bit and put on that Pensacola music. You know, yes, Lord, we will ride with you. And I mean, it's loud. I'm like, turn it up. Come on. Everybody line up. Get up against the walls. I'm like, glory to God, quick, while he's here, let me get my hands on you. We pass it. I mean, and we're going around, you know, and it's like, glory to God. And I'm, it's amazing. I'm laying hands on people. And I mean, I just touch them. And I touch them. And they go, I just fall down. Get out of the spirit. I'm like, yeah, bless God. Oh, yeah. Oh, who's next? Who's next? Come on. I'm like, man, I can't feel my legs. Can't feel my legs. Come on. Make it quick. All right. Now, what I want to share with you is, you know, and of course you had Paul explaining to Timothy, stir up the spirit by the laying on of hands, Timothy, et cetera, et cetera. Which again, so that whole concept of stirring up the spirit is also pervasive in the New Testament as well. And then I can also show you text in Acts where it's very clear that it's the faith of both the Pray the person doing the praying and the person doing the receiving. Now, Curry properly teaches that when you are, if you have a line of people in front of you, say you have a Bible study and you're praying for people to be healed, you know, first off, divine healing doesn't always happen immediately. Okay? There is the gift of healing. There's the Holy Spirit gift of healing, and there's the Holy Spirit gift of miracles. When those two are combined together, that person may receive an instant healing. Okay? But we are all, by the power and authority of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are all to walk. You know, uh, as it says in Mark 16, 18, it is very, very clear, and this is for all of us. And we need to know these things for the days ahead, because when they start locking stuff down, folks, and the church goes home, and the buildings are getting bombed, which is, boy, right around the corner. If you haven't, you heard about the building that was bombed, hopefully, in Southern California. That's the beginning, folks. It's going to get, it's, the brick and mortar church is going away. My sister disagrees with me. I don't, I don't think she's right. I, I'm, I feel we've come to that place. It's already started. It's already started. And we have a reptilian running the country. And there's LGBT and L L and B. I mean, for crying out loud, how can, how can anybody not see this? And we still have seven mountains people out there deceiving people. It just amazes me. But God will bring them low. God will bring them low. And that's just how it'll work. It's sad it has to be that way, but it does have to be that way. So the scripture says, now this is not talking about the gifts of the Spirit right here. Okay? The gifts of the Spirit are covered in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I think it bleeds over a little bit into 13. I'm not sure. But anyway, um, and I'm not going to look it up. But You can. Um, but, um, but again, it says right here, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now, 
But he, but then it, but you got to catch the next, very next part, the second half of that phrase. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Okay. Now, but then the important thing to take away is verse seventeen. Now, first off, we know that baptism is not required for the person to be saved, because if that were true, then prison ministries would be wasting their time, because especially death row prison ministries. You know, people could not repent of their sins on their deathbed because they're darn sure not going to wheel them out to a river and baptize them. And I know way too many testimonies of people that have been on their deathbed and have received the Lord. So we need to have a little bit of common sense. That's how you discern. Discerning isn't always an angel showing up in your room, shining a bright light going, oh, sometimes it just takes a little bit of gray matter, thinking it through. It says right here, um, verse 18, I always say, Mark 16, 16, 18, in my name, in the name of Jesus, they, us, will cast out demons. Wait a minute. Where's my proof that this doesn't require the baptism of the Holy Spirit and some kind of a supernatural anointing or the cross or Pentecost or any of those things? Well, because Luke 10, Luke 10, verse 19, Jesus sent out a bunch of sinners. He called them out of the multitude. They were a bunch of sinners. Jesus didn't even have any blood to give them at that point. And he said, in my name, two by two, go out and, and, and use my name and cast out and do, and do this and do that and go from you know, house to house to house and all that kind of stuff. And they came back and their minds were blown. They were absolutely blown away. And he says, uh, uh, you know, um, he says, uh, here, I'll, I'll go ahead. Luke 10, verse 19. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, all the power of the enemy, all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. No baptism of the Holy Spirit, no speaking in tongues, no blood of the Lord Jesus to call down. Nothing. These are just regular schmoes hanging out in the crowd going, wow, this Jesus guy is pretty cool. All right. Seeing how the power of the name of the Lord Jesus. There was even scriptures where people, where the apostles were all upset because there are all these people out there casting out devils in the name of Jesus. And they came running up and they said, um, uh, you know, Rob and I, should, should we not go and stop them? You know, they, why should they? And Jesus was like, no, let them alone. All right. So. This is not talking here. This is talking about us. It's every one of us. Now, granted, it also says that they will speak with new tongues, which is a reference to the, um, uh, the uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it's not a requisite part of it. As a matter of fact, David Hogan's divine healing, the part of his ministry where people were literally being healed from leprosy and deadly diseases and amazing things. He told everybody, I, I went down to Mexico and I started, I thought, and they were trying, a demon was trying to kill his little son, his little baby boy son, his like three-year-old, trying to kill him. And he went out there and laid hands on his son. His son was dying. And he laid hands on him and he said, In the name of Jesus, I set you free. In the name of Jesus, I set you free. In the name of... And nothing was happening. His son would continue to die, continue to die, continue to die. And then he looked down the road. And there was a witch doctor. And then he knew. The Lord showed him what he needed to do. And he stepped away from his son, and he went down that road, and he pointed his finger at that witch doctor, and he said, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you, I cast those demons into the pit. And the witch doctor ran down the street, and his kid was fine. Talk to the mountain. If you do not know what the mountain is, how in the world do you talk to it? Sudafed annoying. Now, Curry... What actually ended up happening was bunches and bunches of people went out in the spirit, received divine healing, and he's like kind of quipping about the fact that it was all, all on account of the Sudafed stuff. But I don't, I, as I studied under him in later, you know, investments in hundreds of hours, I don't even know how many hours, I don't even know, weeks, weeks and weeks and weeks, um, taking notes, all that kind of stuff. Um, he seemed well. He he believed that it was all in the associated with the faith of the person doing the praying. That's all that mattered. That's all that mattered. The faith of the person doing the praying. And I was like, no, dude, you got that wrong. He did get it wrong. He got it absolutely wrong. As a matter of fact, it's biblically wrong, and it is 
in his very testimony of the Sudafed anointing is proof positive. We are all to stir up the spirit. We lift our hands in praise. If we can speak in tongues, we speak in tongues. If, you know, we get excited. We stir up the spirit. We bring down the power. We bring down Jesus. We bring it down. We get excited. We let our emotions go. And then it starts to flow. That is when it's connected with the power of the Holy Spirit. This is how you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is how you receive the gift of tongues. You don't do it sitting in the corner crying from tears and begging God for something. You beseech Him. You cry out. Yes, you can cry if you want, but you let your emotions go. You let your emotions go. And you find that that, that you get the MP, MP3 version of the last prayer vigil and you pray me speaking in tongues and you mimic while you are you put on some praise music and you just let it go. You gush with emotion. Gush with emotion. Give it to the Lord. Let the power go. Stir up the spirit. Stir it up. Stir it up. That's the key. Our emotions are when they are being funneled with Jesus in us. Now, if we're living in willful and habitual sin, that's a problem. Because we can grieve the Holy Spirit and grieve, and we grieve the Holy Spirit then. And that can be very effective. Now, so, and Jesus said something. I learned this from another teacher. He has nothing in me. She was in jail, actually. I forget her name. It's on the tip of my tongue. She, I have her teaching, too, and I study under her. Um, and the Lord showed her that scripture and explained to her why it was so important. He has nothing in me. See, the key is, we have to be prayed up, clean, purified by Jesus' blood, on fire, the whole thing. Believe. Look, if you believe, why wouldn't you be excited? Why wouldn't you be? And your excitement is what? Contagious. When people laugh, ha, 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 ha. Guess what happens? Everybody else in the laugh, ha, ha. Every, everybody else in the room starts to chuckle and laugh too. When you smile, other people smile. That's interesting. Well, if we're all from the Adamic bloodline and we all had the Spirit of God breathed into our nostrils at conception, which we are, okay, the capital S living soul of God, that the darkness can't get a hold of, but wants it really bad, which is why they do all that weird, creepy ceremony stuff, because they want to get a hold of it. They want to drink stuff they shouldn't be doing, and all that stuff, because that's how they get the power from our, from us. It's very evil, very dark. But that's not the topic. The topic is about the glory. The glory, our emotions, our excitement, our enthusiasm, our because, I mean, and Jesus said, you know, we're not supposed to, you know, be all bummed out. We're supposed to shine the light. We're supposed to be excited. We're supposed to be, you know, the fervent, effective prayers of a righteous man avails much. These are things Jesus even said. He said, um, you know, when, when you look at the scriptures in Mark, you can see it. I, I've done this, but I don't even know how many times, probably, you know, 60 or more shows. I've said, you know, look at Mark 9.25. When Jesus saw the people come running together. Now, why did Jesus wait for the people to come running together? Because this aligns to John 14, 13, and 14. John 13, 14, and th 13, and 14 says uh, that um, it says, and whatever, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, na my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. you got to get that down. That's the quid pro quo. It has to be to glorify the Father. If it is for any other reason, any selfish reason or whatever. So the bigger the crowd, the better. The bigger the crowd, the better. God wants you to speak out. If you're going to get stuck with the vaccine and you're listening to this show and you live over in Belgium and they're going to do whatever they're going to do and give you that mRNA thing, you better lay your hand on that vaccine needle and you better say, in the name of Jesus, I render you saline in Jesus' name. I render you saline in Jesus' name. You are, of, you are inert. You better speak it. Forward. Boldly. That's why uh, Paul, and, 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 and I don't know if it was Paul, maybe somebody else, but um, or maybe it was Jesus. He referred to the sons of thunder. What do you think they were sitting on a rock going, oh, hey, everybody, um, maybe you would like to give your life to Jesus. 
Sons of Thunder? Really? Talk to the mountain! Curry Blake teaches correctly so that when you're dealing with demons and divine healing, you stir up the spirit and you treat it like you're getting bitten by a rabid dog. Go watch the Cujo movie if you need to. Remind yourself what it, that kind of thing, you know, or pretend like you're getting charged at by an angry pit bull. You're not going to sit there and just wait for it to tear every part of your body apart, are you? You're going to fight back. That's how it works. So in Mark 9.25, we have two dynamics unfolding before us that tell us mysteries. We have Jesus saying, right here, for why in the world would this matter, and why would it be in the text of the Bible? Because it is important. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Then he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Death and dumb spirit! He's talking to the spirit. Death and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more! All the people were so amazed. How many times does it say in the Gospels about how amazed they were? Because he spoke with such authority! So one person that was taken to heaven said, I didn't know, but Jesus was a preacher. It's right there in the Bible. But you've got to discern it. But I say, the new covenant. You have heard that it was written in your text that you, should, you know, shouldn't do that or shouldn't do this or shouldn't do that or shouldn't do this. But I say, new covenant. New rules. And his apostles were ordained to establish even additional rules, which is why the whole New Testament is so vitally important to have down before you get yourself confused with the old, which is why there are so many people doing Hebrew roots and getting nowhere in their walk. Okay, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Um, so I hope that you understand that part, because that part is important. It's really, really important. Now, is God not going to heal? If Let's pretend that... Okay, so let's pretend that you're in a Bible study. First off, if you're not the leader of the Bible study, then you may have a problem out of the gate. Because if your faith is... If you're learning things from this program right now, and you put into practice the things that I am helping you to understand right now, after 10 years of learnings and beatings and experiences and unbelievable stuff, they're going to think you're from another planet. <laughs> okay? So that's fine. Now, if you're in a group of really anointed believers, they're going to be wowed, and they're going to want to learn, and they're going to listen. Um, one of the things, for whatever reason, that I was evidently gifted by was, was some kind of, I don't know, I, I'm not saying it's a Holy Spirit gift, I don't know. I don't, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't claim anything. I don't claim anything. But everywhere, every time the Lord took me to any kind of, every time I joined a ministry, I went on prison ministries, I did all kinds of things, so I was so on fire for the Lord. When people would hear me pray, they would come around me. It would cause a commotion. Um, the leaders of the prison ministries would gather around kind of thing. So I don't know. I don't get that, but it is what it is. Praise God. All right. But so anyway, maybe that's why the Lord wanted me to do a prayer vigil. So praise Jesus. But, um, so it's important to understand, do not be deceived. There are many out there that teach you that will teach you things like you don't pray against second order demons. That is false. Is it going to make your life harder? Oh boy, are you going to have to have your ducks in a row? Because when you start going after Satan's generals, you don't like that. You don't want nobody to know about that. But I had a personal friend of mine who had the blessing of being taken into the spiritual realm where they operate against our prayers who saw what happened in the spiritual realm when the saints were praying spiritual warfare prayers. And I thought, that rocks. If I can bring down a can of whoop hiney from the throne room of God upon those entities, especially after what I've been through, 
I am not going to miss that trick. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Show me more, Father. Show me more. I wanted to know. Just because Jesus said, you know, when the demon said, have you come to punish us before our time? Well, Jesus was the one who said greater things than these will you do because I go unto the Father. I figure that includes bringing down the punishment on the demons before their time. And that's what I'm all about. I'm all about taking them out. Which, by the way, if you're going to war with demons, you better get your uh, warfare tactics down pat. You better understand what the rules are, the rules of engagement. You better know what's going to happen if you have willful and habitual sin in your life. Accuser of the brethren is going to accuse you, and it will only be by the grace of God. Sometimes God will cut you a break and let you live through that. <laughs> Which, by the way, is captured in Zechariah 3, verses 1 through 7, where Satan was accusing Joshua the high priest. And the Lord God, our Father, said, bug off, bonehead. He didn't say it like that, but I don't have time to go into all that. I have many other shows. Now, so, can you get together with a group of believers, lay hands on a person in a nice, calm way, and pray together in the name of Jesus, if you pray appropriately, in the name of Jesus, I command this sickness to leave your body. Now, some people will, they'll gather around and they'll raise one of their hands in the air and they'll put their hand on the individual and they'll say, Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you will heal this person. Romans 8.26 Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray for as we ought, or uh, what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. So our Father will oftentimes intercede, and if everything is okay, if the person, you know, it, sometimes God wants to give the individual a testimony, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So there's an exception to every rule. It's always about the betterment of the kingdom of God. It's always about glorifying our Father, always. Now, in the case when I lost my ability to smell because of Zycam poisoning from their nasal spray, which I think they should have been put out of business for, and unfortunately they wiggled around it with their evilness, I lost it for, it was almost, it was probably going to be a permanent loss. I believe it was going to be permanent because it was for over eight months. And I went up to Pennsylvania to my family Christmas party where there's so much incredible food, words cannot describe, and I couldn't smell a thing. And I told my sister, I was seeped in sin. But here's why the Father healed me. Not because anybody stirred up the Spirit. Okay? Not, you know, here's why. There's two reasons why. Father knew, our Father knew that a, I would talk about it, so I w it would become a testimony. And B, there was, it glorified our Father because I, who was obviously a sinner at the time, even just by the way I was dressed, <laughs> hint, hint, um, my sister says, here, Johnny, and she pulls out, this is, this is the most important part. Remember, when Jesus saw the people come running together, that's when he un rebuked the unclean spirit and yelled directly at the spirit and commanded it to come out. Commanded it, like you're kicking a dog, or a rabid mean dog like Kudrow. All right, so anyway, so my sister pulls out a dining room table chair. She sets it in the middle of the room. Now, do you think that she did that? You know, she could have just walked over into a corner and quietly done it, but she did it. You think the Holy Spirit might have placed it upon her heart to pull the chair out? Think so. I know so. She pulled the chair out in front of about 30 people. Put it right in the middle of the room. I sat down. She got one or two other people to come over and lay hands on me. And she just very sweetly and nicely said, Dear Heavenly Father, heal my, bro my brother Johnny's. He has, a, he has a problem with his ability to smell, and I pray in Jesus' name that you will heal him. 
of this ailment and restore his sense of smell and taste. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, the key to understanding is the fa- our father knew I would testify about it. It would become part of my perpetual and forever and ever and ever amen testimony. And my sister glorified God by pulling out the chair in front of everybody. Now, from a spiritual warfare and divine healing tactics, best practices standpoint, she didn't do that good. But from every other aspect, she did great. And about four months later, I was taking a shower. I was kind of bummed out. You know, I was like, I was hoping for something to happen. I, I really wanted to taste some of that incredible corn pudding and stuff, but I couldn't. I was kind of bummed out the rest of the whole thing, but I, you know, I was cool. I didn't say nothing. I just dealt. Anyway, about three months later, I was in the shower and I had some, I don't know, tutti fruity something shower gel I was showering with. And all of a sudden, I smelled this bouquet of flowers. And I was like, oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So please be advised. The vast majority of divine healings do not happen immediately. They usually happen when somebody who is anointed and the people are have their faith stirred up. This is especially, you will see this in things like Smith Wigglesworth's testimonies and things like that. Because the very fact that Smith was known for what he was known for got everybody in the audience all pumped. So they all had incredible faith. And, and Smith was so, you know, unbelievably to use a you know, current day colloquialism, he was so jacked up that everybody else got jacked up and then the anointing fell upon them and and, 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 and faith, it just, it's like laughter. It just rolls through the audience and then it, it became unstoppable. There's one testimony that I read in the book and I forget who, who, which one, and I'm sorry, but the, they couldn't, they were, they had two or three people praying over this man who was very sick on his deathbed, two or three people praying over him. They anointed him with oil. They were praying, 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 and the man would not get up. He would not receive the healing. <laughs> so one of them said, you know what? Maybe it's not enough oil. So they ran and got a bottle of oil, a full big bottle, big old bottle, like a 32 ounce bottle of like, you know, Crisco oil. And they dumped it over the man's head and it freaked him out. And he jumped out of the bed and said, I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. I wanted to learn these things so much that I read book after book after book. I spent hundreds of dollars on training to the best from the best. And then I learned even more, and even more, and even more. And once I understood the rules, the basic rules of algebra, once I, you know, almost died at the hands of a SRADID victim, um, you know, all the people, all the blessings, all the people we brought on the program, my personal not real, real, super close friendship with Andy Duvall, but close enough that, you know, I could call him and talk to him, and he was very kind. Um, But very busy guy. Curry Blake teaches, he actually uh, will train people uh, to be divine healers, and then he has like a switchboard, and you can call and press a button, you know, all different times of the night, and then they pray. But, you know, they're at different levels in their walk. But that's because Curry believes, honestly, that it's the divine healer's responsibility to conjure up, I don't like that term conjure, to muster up the faith. To, you know, so if the healing doesn't occur, it's the fault of the person doing the praying. And that is absolutely incorrect. It's incorrect. If the person's a doubting Thomas and they're standing there with their arms folded, they're not going to receive anything, which, by the way, is captured in the second half of James 1.5. Don't think for a second that that concept of Lacking faith and being double-minded only applies to asking God for wisdom. No, 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 it does not. Spiritual discernment will help you to spiritually understand that that admonishment of James after James 1, 5 applies to our entire walk. Because Romans 14, 23 says, that which is not from faith is sin. So guess what, folks? We have something to confess of every single day, don't we? How many times have we walked past somebody in the grocery store and we didn't stop and ask them if we could pray for them? Because we didn't have faith. 
There is coming a day, folks, when our calling will be sure. And I know that day is getting closer every day. We don't even know how long this radio show is going to last. We don't even know how long before they start setting up real FEMA camps and putting away people away. We don't know. And Biden's operating at the hands of the Antichrist. Did you ever think about that? Did you ever think that Biden is actually the ambassador of the Antichrist himself? With all kinds of helpers like Gates and Fauci and Nazi eugenicists and all that stuff. Wow. And FEMA camps, which are mock-ups of, you know, Treblinka and Auschwitz. And there's even a FEMA camp in, in uh, Nevada somewhere where, where they only take uh, SRA, DID, you know, Illuminati families and stuff like that. They took, um, I'm trying to think of the guy's name, Doc, Doc uh, called himself Doc something. Anyway, he's passed away already, but they took him there. Um, and it, it has the ability with incinerators to kill 40,000 Christians a day. Yep, 40,000. Imagine that. 40,000 a day. You don't want to be here for that, folks. Keep in mind also that when Jesus was talking about the wise and foolish virgins without taking a breath, he merged immediately into the parable of the talents and rewards. Do you think that was a coincidence? No, it wasn't. I'm sorry to tell you this, but it is my understanding. I could be wrong. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Oops, I will share with you my understanding. If you are not productive, and by the way, you can be productive in your own bedroom all alone. You can be in a wheelchair. You can be housebound. You can be a shut-in. And you can have a spiritual warfare ministry. Get it? Nothing's stopping you. That's why I'm doing this. To, to, to foster productivity and to help people understand if we get hit with a meteor shower tomorrow... And the grid goes down for a while. And people are out in the streets. It, first off, they ought to know that you're a Christian home. <laughs> and if they don't know you're a Christian home, maybe you want to get a sign. Let them know. Be bold. Be sons of thunder. I got multiple signs in my house. And I even have another one that I'm getting ready to put out and nail to the... Oh, it's not an oak tree, but it looks like an oak tree. In the middle of my yard, my front yard, I'm going to nail it right to that thing. It says, for prayer and power and peace, come here. Come to this house. This is where you come. Just in case you don't see the large five by three purple and gold Jesus sign or uh, flag out front. Or the big red and white uh, uh, Jesus sign on the door. I'm going to put another bigger sign out there. Because I know by being a son of thunder, hallelujah, that I get all the benefits of protection. I don't have to worry about a thing. Don't have to worry about a thing. <laughs> hallelujah. The last one our Heavenly Father is going to let get stomped by the devil is the one who's being the most productive. Have you ever thought about that? If you're really putting a hurting on Satan like Jesus did, you think he's going to allow the forces of darkness to take you out? I don't think so. Which kind of, in a way, bumps me out because, you know, I really want to go home bad. But there's a reason why the wise virgin's parable segues immediately into the parable of the talents and rewards. There's a reason why Luke 12, verse 47 and 48 says, To whom much has been given, much will be required. There's nothing stopping you. The stuff that you learn on this prayer vigil, the methods for prayer, you have no reason to not be doing it every day. I can do, I can take communion with a candle lit. All of my vessels anointed with Exodus oil. I have a silver... Um, it, it, it's, uh, it's basically an ephod. It's what the uh, Levitical priesthood wore over there. You know, but I got a little silver, um, like a, 
I don't know what you call it, like a charm with the 12 stones of Israel in it. And I just put it on because we are a royal priesthood, First Peter 2, 9. See, I believe. I know it's a true. I know it's a fact. I know that the Lord gave me gave me this golden bowl of forgiveness, and I know he was none too pleased when I was having, you know, it's another whole nother testimony. Oh, my gosh. I just don't have enough time to share it all. But it was all very supernatural. Unbelievably so. So, so powerfully supernatural, so impossible, so unreal that I just, I would just ball. I'd heave ball. You know, not just that, you know, crying thing that, you know, everybody can cry a little bit. I heaved. You know, I was crying so hard that there was literally a puddle of tears on my desk. A big old puddle. I mean, it was like three by four. So how, how, how much I cried. It's happened to me more than once. Because the way the Lord confirms things for me is so, well, it's undeniable. I guess because I'm a kind of a bonehead. I think we are, we're all boneheads, really, when it comes right down to it. Because we slip into the flesh so easily. We lack faith. We let that devil plant that little seed. Oh, yeah, as you're listening to me talk right now, that devil's telling you, no, 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 don't listen to this guy. Then turn it, switch it off, switch it off. Yeah, you don't have to mimic anything. If you get to the gift of good tongues, you're going to speak in tongues, blah, 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 and all this other stuff. You're going to hear doubting Thomas, doubting Thomas, doubting Thomas, doubting Thomas, because that's what the devil's, the devil and his demons do not want you to hear a word that I am saying right now. I promise you. When you cast out demons, you kick them out. You talk to the mountain. And you do it fervently. They are stubborn and they're stupid. I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. And if you cast demons out of an individual, that's good for you. However, you better teach them to go and sin no more. brother. But do it gently and lovingly. Usually people who have demons cast out of them if it worked and you did it fervently, especially if you had a large number of believers, like I've explained to people before, the more believers that lay hands on a person, the more power that is transferred. So the weakness of one individual, it, it, it kind of becomes an aggregate collective of power. And so the power and the faith is it, it grows. So if believer one has a, a, a level two faith and believer two has a level five faith and believer three has a level uh, five faith, then you've got a level 17 faith. It's additive. That's why there's testimonies of people who traveled across the United Kingdom to go get to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit for Smith Wigglesworth uh, from him, and um, and he called some other people over to his house and they and they stood there and they prayed for the guy for hours and hours into the night until it came down and they called they brought it down on him. By the way, that's 100 percent scriptural. I can show you the scripture. There's this place in uh, um, in uh, Acts where, oh gosh, it was like Achaia and Priscilla and Achaia or whatever, and they talked to the person, uh, it was uh, Apollos, and when they met up with him, and uh, they said, but by what baptism do you baptize? And Apollos goes, oh, I baptize by the baptism of John, you see. And they're like, no, 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 let us teach you a better way, a better way. They taught him about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then they all gather around him. And if you read very carefully the words, it says, because it had not come down on him yet. Now you got these unfortunately misguided preachers and pastors in churches, sometimes really big churches, walking up to people at an altar call saying, I baptize you in the, in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then they go to the next verse. I baptize you in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I baptize you in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I, I, I brought a, a, a troubled brother to the church that I was going to, and he went up to, to receive the Lord, and the preacher did that to him, and I went at home, and I was so humiliated. And I had to explain to this poor unsaved guy doesn't work that way. And I'm sorry, brother, I'm sorry. Of course, he was so disillusioned that, you know, that was lost, lost, lost opportunity. Let's put it that way. Very sad.
very sad. People who know a little but think they know a lot are exceedingly dangerous. <sighs> so, remember that there are spirits of infirmity. Spirits of infirmity, you don't have to call them by name. Now, granted, if there are... There's, there's the case where Jesus was dealing with a bunch of demons and he did, you know, say, who are you? You know, I am Legion. And a lot of people make that their mission. You know, they got to get the demon to tell them who they are. Okay, now, if you're dealing with a bunch of demons inside of a person and, is a, and it is a, you know, three hours of work kind of thing, okay, you might have to get into some pretty, you know, asking the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, give me a name, you know, that kind of thing. Or, you know, unclean spirit, speak forth. What is your name in Jesus' name? I command you. They have to obey. But the thing is, if you don't know they're there, you might not ask or command. You know what I mean? you got to command. Now, I'm not going to get into advanced spiritual warfare tactics, because you're probably not going to run across that very much, um, unless that you're going to make spiritual warfare and deliverance your ministry. And, and we've even had people on the program who, they're like, you know, we tried everything, you know, uh, and I love this one particular pastor, and I bring him on again because I love his work. Uh, but, and, he, and I even bought his book. But... Um, you know, he, he said, we tried everything. We tried using these and thous and doing the old English King James. We tried yelling at the demons. None of that worked. Here's the thing. You got to find your place. When you, when you have hit your comfort zone, you'll know it. But I'm just showing you what Jesus did. And I want to be exactly like Jesus. Speak to the mountain. Know your Bible. Jesus did not. The, look, look, look. The 70 that were sent out, they came back mind-blown because they said, even the demons respond to your name. You think they were sitting there going, I command you, demon, tell me your name. I am Leviathan. Blah, 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 blah. Come on, please. But there are people out there that actually believe that you have to know the name. No, you do not. Because if that were true, then Jesus' whole ministry is all dorked up. Because he says right here in Mark 9.25, Death and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. He said in other times, he said, uh, you know, unclean spirits, or, or I'm sorry, spirit of uh, uh, um, infirmity, come out. Read Mark. Write down what Jesus said. Talk to the mountain. And let the person know if you go back into willful sin, you are going to lose what you were given. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. My uh, computer here is uh, messing with me. Hallelujah. <laughs> Curry was uh, really wanting to continue talking. <laughs> Praise God. All right. And you know what? Once you know that if you enter into these things double mindedly, <laughs> with doubt in your heart or willful and habitual sin. Now, it doesn't mean that, that, that you can't... Even Curry, in his teaching, in his training, explains that when he first started going into divine healing, and he would go to, from church to church to church because he wanted to do it so bad he couldn't stand himself. He, learned, he decided he was going to mimic everything that he learned from David Hogan and David Hogan's uh, five-part uh, teaching from... Uh, um, uh, up in a Pensacola Holy Spirit-filled church called Faith to, to Raise the Dead. That's the title of it. And if you haven't listened to it yet, you need to. You'll learn so much your head will explode. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, that's a quip, but you know what I mean. You're going to be blown away. Absolutely blown away. And it was enough to start Curry Blake's entire ministry. He was so juiced up over that, he said, I'm just going to do like David Hogan did. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to mimic what he did, which was brilliant on his part. But the problem was he couldn't find any churches to let him do his thing. <laughs> they were like, uh, like, dude, I don't know you, and you're darn sure not coming in front of my pulpit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which, of course, is an admonishment that you learn in, you know, Titus and Timothy and First and Second Timothy. You got to 
understand the whole counsel of God. You got to get it all. You got to get it all. You got to get it all because it's all important. It's all important. So if you're interested in developing these things, get the book Pigs in the Parlor. Read it. Or if you'd rather, maybe buy a copy of Curry Blake's Spiritual Warfare Apostolic Training. He uses a lot of, a lot of good stuff. And he's very effective. Okay? Or just study Mark and Acts and do what they did. But remember, when Jesus saw the people come running together, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, and then he rebuked the unclean spirit. The more you glorify the Father, the more people that are touched by that event, the more powerfully likely you're going to see something amazing happen. But do not. Hover in your faith. Do not have any issues with faith. Pray anyway, no matter what. Because Romans 8.26 will cover you. But at least pull the chair out in front of everybody, like my sister did. I'm so glad she did that, because I know that chair-pulling-out thing and my embarrassment of sitting on that chair in front of all of my family and their friends as friends as friends as friends <laughs> while she laid hands on me and prayed for me, that, that act alone is probably what made the Lord decide to give me back my sense of taste and smell three months later. And of course, he knew I would testify to it and share it. But after I took my DHT training, my divine healing training, I was so juiced up, I kid you not, folks, I literally grabbed my Bible, anointing oil that I had, and I went straight over to St. Joseph's Hospital. I walked boldly right into one of their wards. Of course, if you do it today with HIPAA law, they'll probably escort you to a police car. <laughs> so good luck with that. But this was before that. And... um and I, 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 I went in and found people that needed prayed for. Her. And I asked them, could I pray? Some cases they had family there. And they were like, yes, please, please pray. You know, did the person like rip the feeding tubes out of their neck? Or maybe an angel of the Lord came upon them while I was praying, while they were in their comatose state and saved their soul. And I prayed anyway. In fact, I was so pumped up. <laughs> this guy probably thought I was going to kill him or something. I feel a little bit sorry for him, but I still prayed. I was driving in a parking lot by a Walmart combination supermarket little strip mall dealie. And I was coming out. I was driving my car out of the parking lot. And I saw a man going down the street in a motorized wheelchair with a little boy going with him. And I said, here's my big chance. So I drove my car over. I swirled it around and I parked it and I jumped out of my car with my Bible in my hand and I went over to that guy and I said, sir, do you mind if I pray for you? And he said, no, I would love it if you pray for me. By the way, let me just tell you something. I have never heard of a time that if you ask nicely, well, actually, one time I asked somebody if I could pray for them. And they said, no, I don't believe in that stuff. Uh, I said, all right, well, God bless you, brother or sister. Actually, this was a sister, and I let, I let her go. Okay? But I will tell you that pretty much the vast majority of times people will always say yes. And they're blessed by the fact that you even cared to give it a try. In the book, How to Heal the Sick, by Charles and Francis Hunter, which I have read a minimum of four times, annotated and marked all the pages, which I have used to minister with to divine healing preachers. Because they were down and out. They got sick. And they couldn't understand why that could happen to them. They believed 
that they should be able to quit their medication because they were hurt and they were hurting. And they believed they had no reason for a doctor. And then they became horribly discouraged when they fell back into unbelievable pain, became immobile, and they felt kind of jilted by the Lord. It was actually kind of like ministry destroying for them. You see? Because that's how the devil works. You get in your head that it has to be this way, even though the Bible doesn't really reveal that at all. And then when it doesn't happen this way, guess what you do? You lose faith. And then the devil swarms you like a pack of African killer bees. And that's exactly what he wants to do. The days that we have ahead, we need to understand these things. We should be praying using these tactics. Now, if you prefer to use other tactics or different things that you've learned from other teachers, praise the Lord. Whatever flips your Jesus switch. As long as it does. I know the journey that I went on, and I do this program to share that journey with people. But it doesn't mean it's the only way, because it's not. Definitely not. Matter of fact, in one of the chapters of the book, Charles and Francis Hunter, How to Heal the Sick, um, the Holy Spirit put upon, I think it was Francis, but I can't remember for sure, there were people that had cancer. And the Holy Spirit placed upon the heart of Francis to tell them to all take their hands, I don't know, it was something like this, I probably, I'm probably, i probably butchering the testimony, but it was something like, they were told, that the, it, they had to like close their eyes, imagine the cross, and they had to put their hands on their chest, take the cancer out, and walk over to the cross, and lay it at the cross. And it would, they would be healed. And everybody who did it, and believed, received the healing. It was a miracle. But that was following the lead of the Lord. It was very supernaturally and divinely led by the Holy Spirit at that moment in time. And she was obedient and saw in the Spirit what the Lord was telling them all to do. But that was it. I, the Lord needed those people to act out in faith. When, look, when Paul walked up, to, you know, outside the tabernacle, okay, or whatever it was, uh, the building, it was, a, it was a temple of some kind, and that beggar guy had the withered up hand. See, pay attention to the details in the name of Jesus, I beseech thee. See, I, I use the King James method to, to impress upon you the importance of it. <laughs> I beseech thee. When Paul went up you know, and said, silver and gold have I not, you know, Jesus would lift them up by the hand. People would, out of faith, they would lower people down through the ceiling of a building. Did you get it? These are acts of overt faith. The person that had the withered hand that Paul got healed, he had to lift up his hand out of faith. The lepers had to go out. There were even people getting uh, healed by the, at that special pool where the angels would come down, and that one guy couldn't even make it to the pool in time. Those were acts of faith. Those were overt acts of faith. God loved it when we are sons of thunder. And we are like Stephen. We don't even feel the rocks hitting us. All we see is the heavens part and the glory and the throne room. That's why the Lord told me after my beating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go into that whole story. I don't need to take that. I don't need to carry that memory into the weekend. <clears throat> we'll just leave it at that. I got a little fleshy, and I thought to myself, boy, after that, i got to get myself some kind of, uh, you know, non-lethal help here. <laughs> so, I, you know, because I, I knew I couldn't, you know, use a gun or a knife or any of that kind of thing. I could never do that. But I thought, well, you know, maybe I could incapacitate the person if they, you know, if somebody like that comes and tries to attack me. I can incapacitate him, and then I can go pray for him. 
And the Lord was like, nope. That is also an act of it's it's an act of it's it's a it's it's no faith. It's no faith. It's an act of lack of faith. I was trusting in the pepper spray. Well, you think somebody's going to receive Jesus when they're writhing around in your front yard, going ah? Or, they're, or, they, or, or you accidentally killed them because they had a heart problem and you shocked them with 10 million volts. The Lord told me to get rid of it, and I did. And boy, let me tell you something. I spent good money on that stuff. I wasn't messing around. I wanted to make sure somebody was coming after me. After what I went through and the blood splatter on the wall my, and the contusion on my head the size of a softball and being thrown like a rag doll down the room by somebody half my size and, and all the other things that happened to me, I was bound and determined to make sure that didn't happen again. And the Lord was so cool. I typed for a living. It's, it's like I typed for a living. And my, my pinky finger was like bitten ha- almost half off. It was really bad. Couldn't type. I really was um, handicapped. But I kept on praying. I kept on anointing it with oil. I kept on believing. I got other believers to pray. And the Lord totally healed me. That's so awesome. I got all the feeling back. Everything came back. Boy, you should have seen the wound. The police didn't like the wound. They didn't like the blood dripping down from my head. And they didn't like the softball-sized contusion on my head. So suffice it to say is the demon was telling the police (laughs) that I was the attacker (laughs) when I walked out of the house with blood all over me and a contusion. I mean, it was literally the size of a softball. I have photographs. (laughs) Uh, Of course, I buried the photographs away because it's not something I want to look at. And then I knew the person was controlled by demons, and I went down and that's how I got one of the ways that I got pretty smart about how the legal system works, because I've had to use it. And I knew that because that person was being controlled by demons, I went down to the state attorney's office and I pleaded with them to drop the charges. And they had, of course, they had to have a reason, because in that case, the state attorney is going to do the prosecuting, and it doesn't really matter what I say. It, we, we, a lot of us believe that if we're the victim, we can automatically drop the charges. That's not how it works. If it's a significant enough event, the state itself will levy the charges against the individual. But because I was able to go down and eloquently articulate on paper what the nature... Now, I couldn't go in there and say... Uh, dear state attorney, the person that uh, demonically kicked my hiney cheeks up and down the stairs and smashed my head into the wall, uh, you know, was uh, possessed because of uh, satanic ritual abuse and disassociative di- identity disorder and had multiple personalities and a strong man demon inside one of them that manifested itself and tried to kill me. I didn't put that on the paper. <laughs> but I, you know pleaded extenuating circumstances, which were all, by the way, true. Every earthly thing that I put on there were all verifiably medical in that particular instance. And so they were able to look into it and drop the charges and everything worked itself out. And to this day, I still pray for that individual every single morning, almost every single morning. The day that I got in contact with um, Dr. Preston Bailey, who's part of Bride Ministries, a partner of Danny Duvall, the very day I had made a an appointment with Dr. Preston Bailey to get her delivered, because I was, oh, I was wanted to, I was indignant. <laughs> I wanted that demon out. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't really understand a lot back then. Uh, I understood a lot. I did understand a lot compared to most people, but I didn't understand every little thing that I needed to. Anyway, so what happened was, believe it or not, the very day, the very day that I had the appointment, it was an initial counseling session with Dr. Preston Bailey. I had to drive over to St. Pete, Florida to meet with him to give him the whole story so he knew that what he was dealing with. 
And that day, um, this unfortunate man who uh, I would help out by letting him, you know, do yard work, um, he yells up to me and says, John, uh, John, you're, the police are here at your house. The very day that I was going to Preston Bailey's ministry office, the police showed up, and there she was as well. And one other family member. It's a long story. Actually, it's a story that lasts, oh, I don't know, almost a year. Yeah. I learned a lot. One thing I learned is just because you think you're asking for something in a righteous, proper manner doesn't mean you're going to get what you think you're going to get. Sometimes the Lord will allow your fleshy request because I was praying out of my own personal loneliness I was discouraged with Trump going into the office of the president and very discouraged with the ministry work that I was given, even though it was prophesied when I was 10. And look what's happening today, right? And that feeling sorry for myself, that discouragement, that fleshy loneliness, all that, as I was in the most holy and righteous way I could think of, and I was very fervent in my prayer, I was out of line. I was out of line. And the Lord let me have it. (laughs) Because he needed to bring me to a new place. And I praise his holy name for it. Because now, not only... That I go through the test, but I also have the money. So now I got the test of money. Praise God. So if you haven't learned how to hear the Lord's voice, I recommend that you go to awi.net. I think it's out there still. Let me see if I can find it. www.awmi.net. There's plenty of negative stuff out on the internet about Andrew Womack. Forget about all that. Nobody's perfect. I never, never think about any of that stuff. I'm just looking to see. Okay, he has, yep, listen. Uh, there's a menu drop down on the main page. It says audio teachings. <clears throat> I'm going to look at that, see if it's there. Let's see if the one that I'm looking for. Um, yo, he has one here on Speak to the Mountain, so he's gotten, he's progressed. Praise God. Speak to the Mountain, so there's the Talk to the Mountain teaching. Let me see, a, a better way to pray. The one that I want is how to hear God's voice. Don't limit God is a good one, by the way. Don't limit God, that's great. Um, there was one here on how to hear God's voice. I'm looking for it right now. And if you can find it, it was a good one. It might have been hearing God's voice or something along that line. Oh, look at here. Boy, he has grown a lot. Harnessing your emotions. Now, he's talking about controlling them. But I'll bet there's some other gems in there, too. Praise God. How to follow God's will. There's a lot of really good. He's excellent to establish some foundational understandings. Yeah, he's got a lot of new stuff on here. Praise God. There's a lot of new stuff on here. But but I, I think a lot of it's very good. Don't Limit God is definitely a good one. Um, I don't know. But anyway, I'm not seeing the one that I, I was specifically looking for. But anyway, um, praise God. So 
I, st- I, I used to work out, well, this was when I was a pup. I was very young, and I was just beginning to grow. And I was listening. I would put on uh, all the free Andrew Romek stuff I could get my hands on, and I would listen, it, listen to it on my podcasting with it in my ears while I was working out. And I, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot. And then, of course, Jonathan Kleck helped me out an awful lot. That was a whole nother chapter of my life. And then, of course, taking, reading a lot of books, reading the Bible a lot, memorizing the scripture a lot, and coming to a place where scripture and I see it all interconnect. Knowing that John fourteen thirteen and 14, where Jesus said that the Father may be glorified in the Son, is the exact reason why Jesus waited until the people came running together in Mark nine twenty five before he rebuked the unclean spirit. That's what's called spiritual synergy and understanding the Scripture spiritually. Knowing in your spirit that the uh, the the you know the the second half of uh, uh, James one five is applicable to all parts of our walk. That's why I don't even like to repeat the second half. I don't want to be double-minded. I don't even want to consider it. When I cast lots before the Lord with my yes or no gold coin, I recite, Father, in the name of Jesus, Proverbs 16.33, which I'm going to double-check for you real quick so that I don't get uh, spanked by somebody. It's not Proverbs 16.33. Um, hard to do shows all, by, you know, all out of memory, but let me see if it is. 16.33. Yeah, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Simple enough for me. Simple enough for me. So to make sure I don't dork it up, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll actually take my yes and no, my yes no gold coin. Um, I don't always anoint it with fresh holy oil, but um, depends, you know. But if I can toss it into my lap, if I can flip it on the air so it falls on my lap, as a matter of fact, I even got a bigger one. I found one that was like uh, like two and a half, almost, you know, probably about two and a half inches in diameter across. It's pretty large. And the reason I did that was because when I was tossing the smaller one in my lap, it would kind of roll around sideways. And I wasn't sure which one it was supposed to be on. But I wanted it to land in my lap because that increased my faith. <laughs> and I needed a quick answer. And I do that all the time. <laughs> Praise God. If I need a quick answer, I want the answer now. <laughs> I don't want to have to look for a billboard. I don't want to have to pray about it, you know, for a bunch of times. I don't want to have to go home and get my thesaurus and anoint it with oil and pray and get myself, you know, stir up the spirit by the laying on of hands, Timothy. I don't want to have to go through all that. I need an answer right now. I speak in tongues. I praise God. And I say, Father, for James 1, 5, if anyone seeks wisdom, let them ask God who gives to all liberally, liberally and without reproach. And it shall be given them. And I cast this slot in the name of Jesus. Father, tell me, do I need to do this or that? A yes or no. Flip it up. Let it land in my lap. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. And I admit sometimes, sometimes the decision is so big I get nervous. And when I feel that nervousness, nervousness enter me, I know I am subject to the second half of James 1 5. Ruh row. When you pray outside of the will of the Father, be careful. You might just get what you're asking for, especially if you need a special learning experience. But don't let that stop you. As Curry Blake says, correctly so. It's the point that we stop moving forward that we become backslidden. It's the point that we stop moving forward that we become backslidden. Praise God. So whether you are praying for somebody's healing, what I would do is knowing that there are, Luke was a medical doctor. Anybody who says that you don't sometimes need to take medicine is wrong. They are wrong. I'm sorry, but it's biblically incorrect. Okay. As a matter of fact, that's covered in detail. And it's 
of How to Heal the Sick with Charles and Francis Hunter. Charles was very upset that he could not get his wife healed in the hospital. He even jumped up on the bed in front of everybody, pointed down at her and said, I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be healed. And she still needed medical attention. Don't ever tell somebody out of faith to stop taking their insulin. You know what I mean? Praise God, because they'll know when they're healed. And it might not be right away. And just remember, when you glorify the Father, when you're a son of thunder, and you stir up the Spirit with the Sudafed anointing, expect go. Expect a miracle. In the name of Jesus, I pray for you and all those who you touch in the days to come. Amen. God bless you all. See you next Friday, Lord willing.